my most spiritual experience was I, I was attacked by a gang of people. We had a very nice performance one night, but the performance was in a very bad neighborhood. Five huge guys get out. So I put out a redunga and we started chanting. And then all of a sudden they came up to us and I just put my hands in prayer. And I said, Hare Krishna, I just started getting beaten and beaten and beat it like fist after fist after fist after fist. I, I felt like if I died then I would be in great consciousness, but Krishna wanted me to live, I guess. Before we jump into this episode, I'd love to invite you to join this candid spiritual community to hear more conversations that will help you become happier, healthier, and more healed. All I want you to do is click on that subscribe button because I love your support. I love seeing all the comments pouring through, all the love pouring through, and we're just getting started. I can't wait to go on this journey with you, whether you're a spiritual seeker or you're just curious about the topic. And we really hope that our conversations will provide you food for thought and inspiration for your own spiritual journey. So join us for honest, candid discussions about spirituality for soul's sake. I'm honored and deeply grateful to bring you today someone who is world-renowned, who is sharing spirituality in an authentic, honest way, and is doing so, in my opinion, really cool, in a really cool way too. So today we have none other than Raghunath Das with us. Thank you so much, Raghunath, for being Honor here. to be here. Pleasure, honor, and it was all mine. Love what you're doing. Thank you. Love the kirtans. Had a great time with you when I came to England. Yeah. That was a really special time, and you had a really incredible uh, audience there. Yeah. And yeah, I was just impressed. Thank you. I should say, by the way, some of you are thinking Raghu looks different to what I thought he looked like because he's been massaged out where at the <laughs> Govardhan Eco Village. Too relaxed now. Too relaxed. Just got out of a massage, still covered with some Ayurvedic oils. Yeah. You should have seen him earlier. He had like cotton buds in his ear as well. So he's, he's, now he looks less cotton budded. Um, you've also written a book. I want to talk about it. From Punk to Monk. Yes. It's coming out April 1st. I'm not sure when this podcast is coming out, but... I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, it's available. I've got some best-selling lists already. Wow. Um, we had a big... Uh, I still, from my teenage days, I had this following of people because I was in a band. Right. Not mainstream music. It was like punk music from New York City. But at an early age, I got really into health and wellness. Just, I don't know why. <laughs> so, really? so, yeah, I just got into your health wasn't bad. And your no, I was into bad. I was into physical fitness, and um, so uh, because punk is sort of alternative music than corporate music at that time. You got to. I'm fifty. Gonna, I'm gonna be fifty eight years old. Fifty eight. Fifty eight. My God, Got a pill to swallow. Yeah. But so when I got into uh, music in New York City, New York City was a dangerous place in the eighties, and I used to leave the suburbs, go to New York City, and I would just absorb myself in sort of alternative music. And with that alternative music scene in Manhattan, there was also alternative everything. Mm. So that's how I got into yoga. That's how I got into spirituality. That's how I got into Ayurvedic medicine. I said, that's how I got, in, I got into vegetarianism. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a big Italian Catholic family. So we all ate meat. Wow. My family was poor. So... They find they grew up that my father was very poor and my mother was very poor. So their symbol of making money was to eat meat. And that at a, at a young age, like 16, I started uh, reading some books about vegetarianism. Vegetarianism, no one spoke about right. in the 80s. It was completely underground. It wasn't in the conversation. And I thought, well, what is the difference between... Loving your animal, pets. I had pets. So I had a dog and I had a cat. And I loved them. And I thought, well, what's the difference between loving them and loving a, a cow or a, a pig? It's not much of a difference. And although that might sound like, yeah, of course, we get that. Most people didn't get that. Mm. And I just said, I can't, I, I, there's, there's a disconnect. One animal you give a name to. Some people dress their dogs up. Some people snuggle with their animals. And another animal is a thing. Another animal is a commodity. And so I started thinking it, from childhood, it's like, this is like the, the I'm, it's like we're creating the minds of a sociopath. Like a sociopath going to kill somebody, but all of a sudden eat breakfast like nothing happens. <laughs> you know, so I was thinking, yeah, this is crazy. It's against the law to leave your dog in the car. Right. Yeah, but you can kill a cow. It, it makes no sense. So I grew up with that 
haunting me. And then I said, you know what? When I turn 18, I'm going to stop eating meat. And so uh, that was the beginning. Yeah, I tell and I tell that story in my book as well too. That was that sort of the beginning for me. And it was it was not for a health reason, it was for an ethical reason. Mm. I just couldn't come to terms with it. And the when I uh moved to New York City when I was 18, I started seeing, oh, I understand. There's a whole group of people that are into alternative diets, healthy living. And so because I didn't know anything about cooking like American culture, oftentimes you don't grow up cooking. You know, until I came to India when I was 22, I never, you didn't, you didn't eat fresh food in America. Everything really? was from a box and from a, a package and reheat, reheated and microwave that. Microwave it. Yeah. yeah. And that's how, that's how you grew up. And so I never had a papaya or a avocado growing up in New York, <laughs> in Connecticut. It was, those were foreign foods. Everything was frozen. So when I first um, went to New York, I wanted, I have to figure out how to cook. And so I took a class on Ayurveda. Mm. Nobody ever heard of Ayurveda. Now everybody talks about Ayurveda. It's a wellness spa. And you go to India and do the Ayurvedic treatment spas all over the world. No one ever heard of it in 1988. There was one book on Ayurvedic uh, medicine. And so I bought the book. I was reading it. And then in the bookstore was a man giving Ayurvedic advice. Mm. And I thought, oh, I wonder if he's an Ayurvedic doctor. Because now I've read this book and I hear him giving advice. And it turns out he w w he was a devotee of Krishna and traveled with the Krishna Guru Prabhupada all around uh -oh. the world, all around India. That's the beginning of the end, right? There. It was the beginning of the end. And so, <laughs> to, to me, I didn't. This was the '80s. There was no internet. There was no cell phones. There was no, everything was foreign. To see yeah, a person in a dhoti, I'm wearing a dhoti right now because uh, I love love wearing these traditional clothes of India. But you didn't. It, it, there was without internet. India was like a weird place far away. It was very distant. It was very peculiar. And it didn't make any sense to me. But he gave me a little bit of faith in that culture. And I had faith in Ayurvedic medicine. I worked at a restaurant, a vegetarian restaurant called Ahimsa, which was owned by a guy who was into yoga in the 80s. And, um, and then I would just start meeting more and more people. And then I got into yoga when I was 19. And that was, uh, and then that's, and between yoga and Ayurveda, I started developing faith in a very broad understanding of spirituality. Mm. I mean, it's incredible what you're doing. And to be honest, I kind of came across you when I heard your tracks with Shelter, the band. And I, I mean, since then, I've just been in love with everything you're doing, Thank spreading you. good consciousness across the world, doing it in a cool way. And uh, yeah, consider me your follower. I'm like, I'm following you. I'm loving you. Um, but what, one thing that strikes me about you as a person is that you're, um, you're focused, you're efficient, you're thinking about things in a broad way, mm -hmm. and I don't know if this is the right word, but we can talk about it, ambitious. Like mm -hmm. you have this drive in you to do something to help others, and I think sometimes ambition is seen as a negative thing. What do you think? I, I think in India... I'm not, I'm not positive, but I, it's, I think in India, that word ambition, the translation of that word, it may mean something like he has an agenda or a material right. agenda. I'm not right. positive. Right. Um, uh, but ambition, like anything in the world, can be used in a wonderful way or it could be used in a horrible way. Mm. You can have material ambition. You can have, you could, like the idea of an agenda. I have an agenda. And so when you say an agenda, you think, what does this guy want out of me? Is this guy trying to use me? What if they want my money? They want my you know, property? What do they want out of me? And so when we hear that word agenda or ambition, there's a lot of connotations that come with it. That same ambition, in a spiritual sense, shouldn't be snuffed out. It should be just engaged in something positive. Mm. You can be ambitious to do good in the world. Yeah. You can be ambitious to help people. You can be ambitious for your own uh, personal edification. Yeah. So I think ambition, if you're born ambitious, like I am, like you are. Straight it, up. Yeah, you just use that, you direct that in, in a way. So uh, a nice analogy is that electricity is not good or bad, right? Electricity you can use for cameras. You can use it to light up a city. You can use it in a, a light when you're performing an operation. Or you can use it in an electric chair and kill somebody. Or you can, if a child holds onto an electric line, it might kill them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's neither good nor bad. It's how you utilize it. And we find everything in the world is like that. And spiritualists sometimes think they have to get rid of 
I was saying this in my morning sangha this morning, that I naturally <laughs> have a big mouth. I talk a lot. I'm a chatterbox. I'm always talking about something. I love it. If I'm in line at a bank or something, I will talk to the person next to me. Uh, he'll, I'll know all about that person. He'll. I'll t uh, if you're sitting next to me on a plane, don't expect to have any downtime. I'll be talking <laughs> to you the entire time on the plane. I'll know everything about you before the plane lands. Oh my I'll God. share my whole story with you. I just like, I, I like to talk. I like people. I thought when I became more spiritual, that would just go away. Mm. You don't, it doesn't go away, but what comes out of your mouth changes. I'm still a chatterbox, but I chat, I chat about spiritual life, reconnection, you know, it, it, going inward. Right. It, you do refine it and some of the things get sanded down, but that, that ability just to chatter is still there. I'm just chattering about spiritual things and I'm chanting stotrams and stutis and asticums and, you know, chanting Bhagavad Gita. I, it's just part, we have a nature and we can't change that nature, but we can use that nature in a spiritual way. Wow. So whether it's ambition or the, these things that are so-called material, some people are really good at making money. Yeah. They just can make money. Money's not evil. You just use your money for a wonderful thing. Yeah. People, and people do, and people use their money for horrible things. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's one of these things that has to just be harnessed. Yeah. My spiritual teacher talked to me about it because like, Honesty, there is an ambition to do something in the world and be something and, you know, be someone. Sure. But it's just a case of engaging that in the right way. And he told me this lesson that if you don't engage it, then when you grow older, you'll grow colder. Mm. You'll become frustrated with the world that it, you weren't able to do what you were planning and hoping and dreaming to do. Sure. And so that's always on my mind. That's in my consciousness. And I'm like, okay, well, I know the goal is one day to fall madly in love with God and to be solely focused on that relationship in a more, I guess, solitary way, rather than being of the world and a person of the world. But right now, the energy is in me, the fire is in me. So, okay, let me engage it. Let me do something about it. Yeah. I want to talk to you about something that maybe in one sense meanders in a different direction. Um, I want to talk about this process that's happening where so many people in the West are coming to this Vedic culture and coming to what many would consider an Indian culture. Mm. What are your thoughts around that? You know, it's interesting. I think about it a lot because I've been coming to India since 1988. Right. And I come twice a year. And I think a lot of the Indians, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I look at it just from observing. I don't know how much Indian I am, to be honest. <laughs> I just got, I've got the skin of an Indian, but like... <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, it's true. You grew up in the West and your parents came to England. Right, yeah. Yeah, so you're the first generation of Gujaratis. In Pretty much. Well you know, yes. Um, but what I've noticed in India is Indians are very close mm. in so many ways to divine culture mm. in terms of dharma and self-control, especially pre-internet. Pre-internet, India was a whole different place. India was a whole different place before satellite television. Because I remember in 1991 I came and I remember them watching Baywatch. <laughs> and I thought... Wow. I was like, UK Mughal invaders came, Portuguese invaders came, English came, everybody came to invade Indian, but Indian culture always stayed. I, and I thought to myself, but satellite television, that could collapse the culture. Mm. And it does, because it changes the idea of normal. That's what happens. So I feel like, but in the bloodline of Indians, it's a very special bloodline in people coming from this Vedic culture. There's a deep woven in the gene. I can't figure it out, but there's a deep woven type of sense of dharma and sense of duty and sense of integrity. Um, just like my my uh, my assistant who's been working with me for a long, and he grew up in India. He's a wonderful guy, incredible musician. And he said to me very sweetly last time I was in India, he said, you know, I just want you to know, you know, when you get older, you can come live with me. I'll take care of you. Wow. It was just like a, you know, he's it's probably, hot woman. He's probably 29 years old and newly married. He goes, you just come with me. You've always been like a father to me. Just come live with me. Wow. And I was thinking, wow, American kids don't say that. No. American kids are like, okay, we've got a special place for you to live. It's cool to hug. It's a place. They're going to take good care of you. The parents are like, no. when you're most vulnerable, the parent takes care of the child. Mm. Right? It's when you're most vulnerable, the parent is the parents taking care of you. And then 
the parent gets vulnerable and you're like, okay, I'm busy. And so I lost my train of thought. What were we talking about? We were talking about Indian oh, culture. Indian culture, I feel like they're so close to Dharma. Mm. But because America and the Western country is so attractive, it's like a shiny piece of glass. And sometimes they're not seeing mm. all the slices on the hand you get when you pick up fast a piece of glass. They don't see the addiction. They don't see the 12-step programs. They don't see the consumption. They don't see the over, overfed and undernourished. You know, they, they're missing out on that. Yeah. They'll find it because India's changing rapidly now, yeah. very, very rapidly. Yeah. And it's going to have to make those same mistakes. Yeah. So even though they're very close, they're looking west, I find Americans and Westerners, this is where the question came from, you say, Americas have done everything. Right. They've smoked everything, drank everything, snorted everything, sexed everything, and they're disgusted with themselves. Yeah. And they say, you know what? And, and oftentimes they didn't have a positive experience of religion. Yeah. Because religion became a... Um, uh, 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 Rules and regs institution. Institution of a God, a fear-based God. Don't hurt me. A sadistic God. Mm. I mean, truthfully, the way that Christianity reads mm. is you screw up, you're going to hell forever. Mm. It's not like you're going to get punished, you're going to get a slap on the wrist, or the crime will fit the punishment. There's one option. It's have, there are two options, heaven or hell. Which one do you choose? Mm. And I was like, wait a second. What kind of loving God is that? That, that you go, you go, I'm going to go to hell eternally? What if I never met Jesus? What if I was living in um, Tokyo in the year one? How is that fair that I have to go to God, uh, hell forever? And so I was really frustrated with that. I love the New Testament. I appreciated the ideas of forgiveness and the ideas, um, uh, the, the idea of uh, uh, love your enemies. I thought this was an incredible way to look at the world. What a paradigm shift of like an animal propensities where you just want to attack and kill and have revenge. How nice. But then when I heard it explained to me, like, wait a second. The God you're talking about is not how I understand mm. God. It's not even how I understand the Bible. What I hear here is, this is a sadistic God. We better step in line or we're going to go to prison forever. And so to me, I didn't give up the Bible, but I gave up that concept of that, um, uh, 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 of this concept. Fear-based. This fear-based religion. And because of that, I think a lot of people have issues with God or a personal God. So when you hear that God can be everything, that we are part of God, and that God is the universe, God in plants and God in trees and, and God in animals, that's attractive because we've been sold a counterfeit. Uh, we've been sold like, this is the only way to approach God. Everything else, so it's, naturally we want to reject yeah. it. You almost feel like... the. You know, as an I mean, as a non-Indian Indian, I don't know if that not India India. Uh, yes. I almost feel like putting my hands in front of India as a country. Just go, wait, 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 wait. Are you sure you want to do? This? Are you sure you want to do this? Right. Like, you, I've been there. I know what it's like. Just, just be patient. Like I know you want to enjoy the material world. I know you want to try everything. <laughs> but at the same time, like you said, they don't see the addiction that the, the Westerners have to go through. The 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 pain, and sorrow of trying to let go of all those things. It's like. You want to almost bubble wrap it, but then at the same time, what can one man do? You know, you just have to say, well, if you're going down that route, this is. Well, I think, uh, I think there, I think Westerners getting into it, 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 it it's, it's wonderful. Mm. I, I like to promote it. I'm the biggest, um, I'm the biggest uh, Propo fan, yeah. proponent of the Indian culture for Westerners. Right. Um, but at the same time, I, I I believe that Sanatana Dharma is there for everyone. It, it, India doesn't own it in one sense. The origins of these holy places uh, and the books and the teachings, India is the ho holy place, but no one owns it. It's not Indian. Everybody's a spirit soul. We're not a body. Everything that we have, we can change. Yeah. Hindu, Christian, Islam, is, et cetera. These are all temporary designations and they're changeable mm. in the same way our bodies are changing. Everybody and every, every being is a spiritual being, and we forget that. Um, and um, I, I'm not a New York Italian Catholic. Mm. I'm not that. I'm an I'm a spirit soul. Mm. That is what I am eternally. What I am temporarily is well. I'm a dad, a part, you know, a spouse, 
you know, uh, I'm a son and I'm a yoga teacher and I, you know, I have a podcast and I'm an author and I was a musician. So I, I'm all these things. That's my small I identity, but there's a capital I identity to the degree that I connect with that small I identity. That's okay. It's just not going to fully satisfy me. And people are struggling desperately in America. It's a nightmare of like really? this identity. Who is my uh, identity politics? Who am I? It's really a simple answer. You're pure spirit soul. You call yourself anything less than that. You're cheating yourself. You'll never actually be satisfied. They want to find connection with culture, with politics, with gender, with gender preference, with, you know, uh, with affluence. You can't. It's just not going to give you lasting identity because there is already a lasting identity. And from this identity, it's true inclusivity. True inclusivity means we're all included, mm -hmm. right? We'll, we'll, we'll include you even if you're not of this species, right? We'll include you even if you're our enemy. Why? Because everybody is a spiritual being. Um, even your enemy, if you're a Democrat, the Republican is a spiritual being. If you're a Republican, the Democrat is a spiritual being, right? Yeah. If you're, uh, right? If you're, if you're Ukraine or if you're Russia, you're still spiritual being. You're all included. We'll step right outside of the human species and say, actually, no, the circle is even bigger than that. Every, every living being. And imagine if you had a culture that respects the earth as a being, the plants as a being, the trees as beings, Right? The mountains as beings. In the, the Himalayas, they say, are beings. Mountains in the Himalayas. And all of us from different tribes, so to speak, we're all spiritual beings, and that's where we find our connection. That, that's the roots. God is the roots. And I think Vedic culture, Sanatana Dharma, they explains it so, it's such a broad gate to spiritual life. Mm. And that's why I appreciated it. Not that information isn't there in other spiritual teachings, it's, it, it is good information, but I feel like if you really want to understand it in a deep way, then I t from a young age, I turned east. Mm. What do you say to people that are worried, like people that we meet in America, London, et cetera, Europe, that are worried about our passion being of a conversion spirit? Like, oh yeah, you're just trying to convert us to being... Hindu and trying to convert us to being an Eastern way of living. No, no, I like the traditional. Sure. You know, I like the traditional God. You know, I like, I like, <laughs> I like heaven and hell. Like that's, that's me. And, and conversely, here's a converse. What do you think about people of India being worried about Westerners adopting Hindu culture? Sure. Well, first with so the big second question. question first, second question first. Yeah. India, again, it's coming from India. But this is actually, truth is that no one owns truth. No one owns absolute truth. It's like math. No one owns math. Math is... Uh, Even two plus, two plus two plus two. <laughs> two plus two is four. Yeah. That, there's no such thing as I got a PhD in Hindu math, Christian math, Jewish math. All, the, <laughs> all there is Vedic math. But yeah. the, idea, the idea is truth is truth and it's for all people at all times. And we want, we're always, the soul is naturally truth hunting it's hunting for truth mm. and so that's an appetite of the soul no one owns it i think it can be found in some cultures in some cultures it can't be found it's buried in some cultures it's hard to find truth it's it, in some cultures you're just trying to survive uh but uh and even in india we say it, it's be, it's become a very very uh in uh, uh what's the word uh the, the, um progressive um, developing, yeah. powerfully developing nation. Yeah. And so uh, since I was coming in 1988, some of the places I used to go visit are cemented over. Holy places become parking lots, you know? So you have to go there with a keen eye. No one, so my point is no one owns truth. Mm. It's for everyone. But we appreciate all this stuff is coming from India, mm. you know? And at the same time, the other question, well, are you trying to convert us? I don't try to convert anybody. I couldn't care less what you do with your life. Right. You know, but if you find something that tastes good, you want to share that with somebody else. So I don't consider myself a preacher. Mm. I consider myself just sharing what I do. And if people like it, they sign up for it. You know, if I'm giving a, a pilgrimage, they sign up for it. If they come to my yoga class, they're signing up for it. 
I'm not begging them to take it. If they don't want it, fine. You know what I mean? Uh, when I was a musician, I would sing about this stuff. And if you like, if you like it, you inquire from it. Right. Um, but I had a, I had a letter from a person that said, you know, because in my teens, uh, not teens, in my twenties, I was in a band, and my band, as the book says, punk to monk. But then, strangely enough, as a monk, I started doing music again, and this band became even bigger than the first band. Um, but all the all the teachings were that of the Gita, mm. teachings of Vedic culture and Gita. So I would get people attracted to the message of Sanatana Dharma. And we talk about spirit, we talk about temporality, we talk about reincarnation, we talk about our connection on a deeper level. We talk about the mind and the problems of the mind, uh, etc. So one person wrote me and they said, I'm a big fan of your band. It touched me in the deepest level. I became a strict vegetarian or vegan. And he said, and I've decided to move to Alaska and I moved into a monastery. Well, I'm an I'm a, a Orthodox uh, Christian. Incredible. A, a Greek Orthodox Christian. Now, when I hear that, I'm not thinking, oh man, they got them. <laughs> I wanted to get them. I don't, I don't, if that's how God comes to that person, I think that's a wonderful thing. Right. And, and here's the interesting thing. When you get more and more into spirit, you should be filled with, you should be more appreciative of other cultures and other ways that they're getting into spirit. If you're getting more into spirit, but you're finding yourself hating people that are different than you, that's a problem. Mm. Then you're not really getting into spirit. You're getting into a type of tribalism. You're getting into the accoutrements of the culture, but you're missing out on the essence of the culture. And this is what I like uh, about what I study. It, we, we want the essence. Who cares if you wear a costume change, right? A person can dress up like a cop. Does that make them a cop? No. Who cares if I put in a spiritual outfit? but I'm doing, my mind is filled with materialistic things. We don't care about costume changes. We care about it's change of heart. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's change of consciousness. It's a ch change the way you treat yourself, the way you treat that. other people. I love that. That really makes a difference in the world. I love that. I want to hear something from the book. Is there any particular story that you really feel inspired by that you feel people relate to? I mean, there's many stories in there, but is there one that comes to mind that you feel inspired to share? You know, I had a, a really great, I, I shared the story on Joe Rogan, but if you don't mind, I'll share yeah, it Yeah, sure. It I'll was a, it. Um, it was probably my most spiritual experience in my life. And some people have a spiritual experience at a kirtan. Some people go to a holy place. They want a pilgrimage. My most spiritual experience was, I, I was attacked by a gang of people. Most spiritual moment? Was, I was attacked by a gang of people. Wow. And um, it was, we, we were in a band. This is when we when I first started a band, I was a monk still. I was a brahmachari. I was a celibate monk, waking up early, uh, going to bed early, living in an ashram. But going to bed. Well, <laughs> yeah, going to bed. No, well, what happened was we started applying the principles of the Gita. Wow. And I already was a famous, when I got into being a devotee of Krishna, I was already, I had tens of thousands of fans around the world. And after being um, living a regular life as a monk, I, I, I gave up music. I said, you know what? I'm over this. I'm sick of competition. I'm sick of envy. I don't want to be the center of attention. I want to be a simple monk. So I went to India, did simple things. Simple things. You know, okay, I'm going to wash everybody's plate. Okay, I'm going to, you know, serve out the uh, kitchery for everybody in the ashram. Mm. Okay, I'm going to wash my own clothes. For me, that was like a, a, a dimple, di different life. Then I went back to America and I lived as like a, a simple monk at an ashram on a farm. Okay, I'm just going to go, uh, you know, uh, what life harvest. Yeah, and it was different. But I started to notice something. Like you were saying earlier, you had an ambition. Mm -hmm. And you had a desire to reach out. And I, although it was a good detox for me, I felt like my calling was to speak. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even more than like music. It was like to speak, to, to share, to communicate, to connect myself and to reconnect with others and to, with God. So I thought, I'm not meant to do this. I'm meant to follow the Gita. Arjuna was a warrior. I'm a warrior in, in one sense as well. And I'm, I've got a different role. It was like when, from the Mahabharata, when Karna was, was born with a gi giant body and his parents were chariot drivers, he was thinking, well, I'm, I feel like I was born to, to be a warrior. 
And so in that mood, I said, you know what? I'm not meant to live on this ashram anymore. I meant to do music. And so then I w went to another ashram in a city in Philadelphia and I found other musicians and I put together music that was similar to my old style, but the lyrics were all transcendental. And that band was called Shelter. Mm. And then we toured the world with this band and this band got even bigger than my first bands. And um, anyway, so as a monk, we would not eat food unless it was cooked by Brahmins. So we would bring a stove with us wherever we want, wherever we went, and we just cook our own food on the side of the road and stuff like that. And um, we'd perform, and I would come back from India with different types of, you know, all different things. Tulsi beads and bead bags and Jaffa malas, and, as well as our regular band merchandise. And we set up our bands, and instead of like having a booth at a club, we would have, we would set everything on a table, and we'd sit on the ground, and we'd chant bhajans. Wow. And so it was very, it, you had two different worlds. You had very loud, amplified music. And then you had us sitting before the show, singing these, you know, Krishna bhajans or, you know, little kirtan. And so our, our fans would come around and they'd buy a shirt, and they'd buy a Bhagavad Gita and they, they would just get, they didn't understand like this is two different lives. And like this, you guys are into this. Yeah, we're into meditation. We're into sound meditation. And, and they were just fascinated by it. So we would do this all over America, all over Europe, and then um, all over England. And then um, something interesting happened. We had a very nice performance one night, and it was, but the performance was in a very bad neighborhood. And that bad neighborhood, we didn't sort of realize it in the daytime. And our vehicle was, after the performance, our van was parked inside the club. You could drive right inside the club. And we were taking down the, PA and the cameras and the lights and the, we were loading up all our gear and I was outside in the parking lot getting interviewed. Mm. And as we were getting interviewed, as I was getting interviewed, I saw a car pull up. This is a classic American story, you know? Right. A car pulls up and these five huge guys get out and they were definitely, my, my audience was young. They were from 15 to 25. I was like 20 to 23 or 24. And um, these guys came out and they just started beating one of these fans. Oh my and God. And we were sort of shocked. I was, I, I was sitting there alone getting interviewed and me and the guy were getting a little shocked watching this, but we just sort of kept on going in a very awkward way. Then they left him down and they beat up another person. And by the time they got to the third person, everybody started running. And they were so much bigger and... You know, it looked like, you know, we were in a ghetto in Buffalo, New York. Wow. And so I quickly went back into the club and I went to the band. I said, hey, you guys, we got to get out of here. You know, it's two o'clock in the morning and there are these crazy guys outside. And the band looked at me like, we can't go anywhere. It's like none of our gear is loaded in the van yet. And I, I, all the doors of the van were open and, and we were thinking. And as soon as they said that, like, we can't go anywhere. I saw the, the bad guys, I saw their car drive into the club and park right in front of our van, sort of blocking us in. They're coming for your gear. You know what? They weren't. Oh. They, it was, I, I don't know what they were doing, but somehow they were just causing trouble. Oh my God. But the guy, the biggest guy who was massive, <laughs> he pulled out a gun and just said, now there's not that many people. There's probably 20 Five, 35 people in the club, the bands, the people running the performance. The guy just said, I've got a gun and I'm going to kill everyone tonight. And it, it was just one of those wake up calls that you get when you hear like, oh, tonight's the night. I forgot that we all die. It's one of these things as a monk, you read every day that life is temporary, your body's temporary, people leaving their bodies, etc. But you'd never think it's going to happen to you that day. <laughs> and it just came over every, because if it, some people ask now, well, why didn't you run? Why didn't you fight? Why didn't, it was just one of these things. It's hopeless. Everything is hopeless right now. And we just accepted, oh. And then they started beating somebody down and my whole band, who are a little bit younger than me, came to me. And they just said, and they were all monks also. They said, Raghunath, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going to die.
I don't know where that came from, but I just said, we're going to die. So we're going to chant, go get me the redunga. Whoa. And so one of the guys went in, got the redunga. So I put out a redunga. Redunga is an Indian clay drum. And we started chanting. Started chanting prayers to Narasimha Dave, the avatar of Vishnu, the ferocious form of Vishnu. Usually Vishnu is very beautiful, very smiling, but you pray to Narasimha Dave for protection. So we start we, in a circle. We are chanting on this Indian drum. And we weren't dressed like monks. We looked normal. So they weren't beating us up. It wasn't a hate crime, although they were filled with hate. It wasn't a, they weren't picking us out because we were a bunch of monks. We all looked the same. Um, but we were chanting. And then all of a sudden, they came up to us. And all the guys in the band ran, understandably. They ran under the van, in the van, here, there, everywhere. And I'm surrounded by these guys holding a drum. My God. And he grabs the gun and he just says, you want some? <laughs> and I was like, you want some? Like, what kind of question is that? <laughs> I was like, I'm supposed to say yes, no, please. And I just put my hands in prayer. And I said, Hare Krishna. I'm a devotee of Lord Krishna. And I have, and I have no idea why you are angry. And then I felt for the first time in my life, I felt completely helpless. I just started getting beaten and beaten and beaten, like fist after fist after fist after fist, completely helpless and just standing there. But something very peculiar happened in that beating. And, um, you know, if you read the Mahabharata or if you read these great Vedic texts, you know, the great yogis, they leave their body meditating on Vishnu, meditating on Krishna, the great grandfather Bhishma of the Mahabharata. He was dying and he said, bring me Krishna so I can look at Krishna. And so there's this idea of almost like a romantic type of death. And, uh, and here I am in a ghetto in Buffalo, New York, uh, when no one knows where I am and I'm getting, I'm about to die. I'm getting pounded, maybe possibly die. So without even thinking, I just started chanting. I started calling different names of God. I said, Krishna, Madhava, Govinda, Chaitanya. Every punch, another name came out of my mouth. And I was like, wow, I can't believe it. I'm, I'm not trying to chant. It's just coming out of my mouth. And then as I was down holding my head, I noticed like five women coming. I thought they were coming to protect me because they all had baseball bats. But they were the girlfriends. And then I started getting hit with a baseball bat three times in the head, one time in the shoulder, one time in the hips. And every time I got hit, Krishna Govinda Ram, I'm just chanting. And in my mind, I'm thinking, and, and there's blood everywhere. I'm thinking my head must be split open. And I'm thinking, God, I'm dying, but I'm chanting. And I was actually, happy i was like this in my mind i'm thinking this i'm thinking great yogis work their entire life to get this position right here where they're about to die and think of krishna and it's happening right now i'm thinking of krishna i'm about to die i'm thinking of krishna this is the perfection of my life <laughs> and i was actually i don't know why but i was fearless i was i was actually sort of welcoming to die now and um <laughs> Then all of a sudden, everything just stopped. And I don't even know what happened. But in, in reality, I found out what happened. All the guys from the band jumped in the van, not realizing. They didn't see me get beat up. So they just started the car and plowed through their car. They started our van and it plowed through their van and they took off. And when they saw, oh my God, Raghunath's not here. So they didn't know what happened to me. I didn't know what happened to them. But I was somehow ended up in the street covered in blood. I had blood from my head to my ankles uh -huh. and I'm still holding this drum covered in blood. And I'm trying to stop cars for help because I thought my friends were in there. So I'm trying to stop cars. So cars would slow down, look at me and then just speed away. Yeah, they're crazy. Yeah, wait, who's going to pull over and help me? And so I found some booth, some, some like bus depot or something and i went in and i told the guy listen i need to use your phone 
I, I said, please call the police. My friends are in trouble. And at this point, I think I'm, I'm about to leave my body. I, my, I, my head must be swollen. You know how your brain, they say your brain yeah. swells, then you go unconscious. And I just was on my knees in this dirty place, holding, still holding a drum. And I'm thinking, I wasn't expecting to die tonight. I even write songs about it. I wrote a song. This world's like a dream. It's not what it seems. We think it's solid, but it fades instead. Our whole world. I said, I said, and I started praying, sincerely pray. I said, Krishna, I know this world is a dream. I sing about it, but now I see it's a dream. It's all gold. I just played a great performance. I was around all my friends. We were all joyful. And now some tragedy. And now it's over. And I said, I am so grateful mm -hmm. that you made you 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 allowed me to like feel what it's like to be. I know I'm not so advanced in my spiritual life, but you gave me a chance, like a taste, of, almost like when you watch a movie, you watch a trailer of a movie to see what's the movie gonna be like. I was like, this is what it must be like to be a pure devotee. I was like, Krishna, you gave me a chance to understand what it's like to be a a great soul, a mahatma. I said, but here's my fear now. I feel like I'm just going to fall asleep and then die. And I won't be able to chant. And I prayed, Krishna, please, if you want to take me tonight, please take me now. And I started chanting the Brahma Samhita. But I didn't die. <laughs> I, was, I, I felt like if I died, then I would be in great consciousness. But Krishna wanted me to live, I guess. I mean, if that isn't a story that's going to make you want to pick up this book <laughs> and get a copy, what date? April? April 1st. April 1st, 2024. I don't know what will. So please do check out this book. I feel like anything we speak after this is going to be nothing in comparison to that story. It is just one crazy story after another. My story is through India and traveling through India and trying to figure out who I am. Am I a Hindu? Am I a Christian? Am I a punk? And so traveling through India in the 80s and 90s is very special too because it's uh, in trying to in, in a meeting of different sadhus and people i'm gonna read it april 1st Thank 2024 you. check it out all, all places amazon amazon you get it on amazon right now pre-order it pre -order. And you get it on audible as well if you just like to listen to audiobooks you're speaking the audible i'm speaking the audible i mean that's the people check it out april 1st bro this has been incredible thanks so much i'm actually blown. i don't have any words after that story it, but like I said, that made me realize this stuff is real. Yeah. This process works more than anything else. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks Keep so doing much what comments. you're doing. If you enjoyed this episode, please do check out all the other episodes for soul's sake. Drop us a comment. Drop us some thoughts on what you felt, what you thought, what you what what changed your consciousness today based on the conversation that we've had. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Soul's Egg. Thank you, everyone, once again. Thanks, and check out our podcast. We do a daily podcast every day. Wisdom of the Sages. I forgot to mention. Wisdom of the Sage. It's okay. Wisdom of the Sage, a daily yoga podcast about all yoga philosophy and, and, and the Srimad Bhagavatam. Sounds deep. Let's go. And it's fun. <laughs> it's deep and dope and fun. See you soon. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. If you love this episode, you'll love my interview with Keshava Swami on serving others and how our life gets ironed out in the process. Go check it out. When I have managed to find that selflessness, that sense of it's really not about me, but I'm really here as a servant to give, then I found two things happen. The first thing is that our ability to actually really serve others um, just expands exponentially.